I've been studying vaccine mandates for the last few years. I remember when I interned at the CCF a few years ago, our, our executive director said, you know, you should look into these vaccine mandates because this is what's coming next. And I was like, no, this is a free country, <laughs> Joanna. Things are crazy, but that's never going to happen here. So I am here today with a guest, which is something I've never done before, but this is a pretty big update. This is Josh. Hi, Josh. Hi. Uh, he is a new lawyer that we have hired very recently at the Canadian Constitution Foundation to take on cases for us. And he has some exciting new projects that we're going to tell you guys about. So Josh, thank you for coming today. The CCF is growing thanks to the dedication of all of our amazing supporters, so we have been able to bring on the talented new lawyer, Josh, uh, to work on our precedent setting cases about fundamental freedoms in Canada. So right off the top, Josh, I wanted to talk about one of the new projects that we're doing at the CCF that you have started. It's a brand new podcast. And I obviously know about it since I'm one of the one of the co-hosts and we've done a few episodes already. But what can you tell everyone watching today? what to expect from the new podcast and where they can listen to it. Yeah, so the podcast is called Not Reserving Judgment. It's been a lot of fun to record. Uh, it's a weekly podcast featuring me, Christine, and our boss, Joanna Barron, who's the executive director of the CCF. And the idea is to uh, keep you updated on legal news. So we go through the most interesting legal news headlines. We also give you a little freedom update, which uh, where Christine talks about some of the cases that we're working on. And we give you our bad legal takes of the week. And this is where we take uh, a lighthearted look at some legal opinions that didn't quite land. So basically we're um, we're, <laughs> we're trying to be nice, but in the, at the same time, we're not reserving <laughs> judgment. So uh, we do try and give you, you know, our honest opinions about the constitutionality of uh, various laws and proposals. So it's a weekly podcast, like I said, it's on Spotify. It's on YouTube, it's on Apple, and uh, since you're on YouTube, I'll encourage you to go um, subscribe to our channel. We've only got a few subscribers right now, so it'd mean a lot if, uh, if people could go and click the subscribe button. Yeah, I'll put a link in the description below to our new YouTube channel, Not Reserving Judgment. We have four episodes so far, but Josh, what can people expect from those episodes? What have we talked about? What are some of the topics we've covered so far? It's, uh, it's only been uh, four episodes, but we've covered so much already. Uh, for example, yesterday we got into this really important debate about uh, involuntary treatment and uh, whether it's constitutional to ask people who are you know, committing re repeat violent crimes uh, to, to do treatment uh, in an, an involuntary basis. Um, so that's one example. Another, another thing we got into is this um, this controversy over, or maybe not so much of a controversy over judicial appointments and whether it's okay for, you know, uh, people applying to be judges to go to either liberal or conservative party fundraisers. And uh, we, we have varying viewpoints on that. Um, so those are just a couple of examples. Yeah, one of the things I love about the podcast is that Josh and I do not always agree on an, on everything. And on our most recent episode, there's actually an update about the case that I have not mentioned on the YouTube channel, on this channel that you're watching. And I probably won't because it's all about the inner workings of legal charities, because I know some of you are really passionate about the work we do. If you want to learn about that case, if you can subscribe to the channel, Not Reserving Judgment, you'll learn all about that update. Now, Josh, I wanted to get a little bit into your background and why we decided to hire you. We, you'd worked with the CCF for, for a summer, but um, I, you have a really interesting and unique background as a lawyer. And I thought maybe you could explain some of that background and how it got you interested in working for the CCF. Yeah, so I'm not your uh, typical lawyer. I had a whole other career before this. I worked at um, I worked in journalism, so I started out at McLean's Magazine, and then I worked at uh, CTV for several several years. I also wrote a lot of you know op eds and opinion commentary, um, and I got interested in working at the CCF. I actually remember the exact moment when this happened. Um, it was when the CCF was working on the Free the Beer case. So this is the Como case. 
This is a New Brunswick man who, you know, went across the border to Quebec to buy some beer and brought it back across the border into his home province and was uh, ticketed for that. And this was a whole uh, division of powers case because um, there's there's an important part of the the Constitution Act 1867, uh, Section 121, that um, would appear to suggest that we have free trade in Canada, but the Supreme Court found otherwise. So, you know, I got really interested in law just through journalism. And um, since journalism is uh, sort of in perpetual decline, you know, where I worked, there were layoffs every year. And I thought one year it's going to be me. Um, I decided to, to go to law school and uh, try and um, work uh, somewhere like the CCF. So in your new role as counsel, obviously you have the, the podcast, but your role is more than that. You're going to be acting as a lawyer and representing us directly in cases. So what are the types of cases that you're hoping to bring as the new lawyer for the CCF? What are the priorities for you? Well, the priorities for me are, they line up pretty well with the priorities of our, our donors, uh, which is pretty great. Um, my, my number one priority is always going to be freedom of expression and freedom of assembly because, you know, I worked in journalism, so I know how important it is that uh, people can say controversial things, that they can have opinions that go against the grain because often, um, you know, people with those sort of minority viewpoints end up being right in the end. Uh, so freedom of expression is up there. Um, I'm also really, really interested in this idea of division of powers being protective of our liberty. Um, if you look at our constitution, I'm reading a great book right now by Malcolm Lavois, um, where he talks oh, yeah. about the trade and commerce power. And if you look at our Constitution Act 1867, it's designed to to um, to allow for things like free trade. And so I want to uh, sort of uh, help bring back some of the respect for the division of powers that's been lacking in the court in recent years. And also, you know, common law property rights, for example, is another thing we're quite interested in. So those are, I'd say, the top three. I'm so excited to see the types of cases that you bring as our new lawyer, Josh. And if you have a suggestion on the type of case that you would like to see Josh bring, leave a comment below explaining what the priority areas are for you. So Josh, one of the other projects that we have going on that you're working on is a forthcoming book on freedom of expression that we're working on together. So why don't you tell uh, our subscribers a little bit about that book project? Yeah, so this is a this is like an easy to read ebook um, if you're interested in free speech, but maybe you don't know all that much about it, or maybe you know some things, but you want to know more. This is just going to be, you know, pretty short, um, easy to read book for our freedom insiders that'll go through the whole history of freedom of expression. So we start, you know, way back like 800 years ago when they start uh, passing laws against libel that are used to, you know, uh, shut people up basically. And, uh, you know, the next thing that comes up is the the invention of the printing press and you know no sooner was that invented than the king was passing laws to um you know monopolize what you could print and hauling people before the court of the star chamber if uh, people said things that the king didn't like and and it's still happening today it's uh one of those things freedom of expression is just perpetually under threat you know um obviously things are a lot better now you can print books you can say a lot of what you want to say but we do have uh, sort of law after law coming up, um, especially federally, that is restricting or infringing on freedom of expression. For example, C-36, this, this bill that um, would uh, allow people to bring uh, other people before the Human Rights Tribunal at the federal level if they say things that they don't like online, you know, and potentially have to pay the person, you know, $20,000. Um, potentially have to pay a fine of up to $50,000. So um, these threats are just sort of uh, constantly coming. And so we go through all of the all of the legislation and try and explain, you know, where we're at now. Yeah, I think that that is some legislation, proposed legislation that I definitely want to do an update about on this channel because it is so concerning. Now, we, of course, have a lot of ongoing litigation, uh, which I regularly update our subscribers to this channel about. We've got the Jordan Peterson case. We've got a case in Quebec about the ban on school prayer. We've got a case where the government is arguing they have immunity from being sued over illegal laws. And we've got a protest ban in Calgary, an election sign ban in Ontario and Brampton. 
Josh, what do you think of these cases? Which of them are you the most excited to work on? I'm excited to work on all of them, but you know, free expression is, uh, it's, it's kind of my thing. So this Calgary protest ban, like I, I don't know. I'm sure you've updated your viewers yeah. on this, but I I'll link to one know. of the videos in the description as well, explaining that case if you're not familiar. I don't know if you've updated them though on the fact that we now have a date. Oh so, yeah, we do. And this date is in February 2025. <laughs> so what that means is, you know, for those who who don't know the the case, Calgary basically decided they're going to ban a very very wide um, uh, breadth of pro of protests. Um, and the way that this law, it, it's, it only applies outside of libraries and recreation centers. But if you open a map and look, that's um, most of the city. So I think basically the city is saying, you know, protest is illegal in this city unless you do it in front of city hall. And, and on the topics that we approve. Yeah. So that's the biggest issue. Like freedom of expression, you're supposed to, the whole point is that you you can say whatever you want to say. The, that's the whole point of freedom of expression. But they've decided that they're going to ban I don't know, I, I don't remember the exact wording, but it's something like, you know, protests that disapprove of ideas related to, and then they list all these things like, you know, gender, race, uh, ge gender identity. Um, Sexual which, orientation, yeah. race, religion, disability. Right. Family status, yeah. I think might be yeah. one of them. Like they, and this bans almost every protest. Like Christine came up with a bunch of examples that are realistic of protests that are going to be banned, but I think it even includes potentially Black Lives Matter protests mm -hmm. or Take Back the Night protests. And the law was targeting a very specific type of protest, which was anti-drag queen story hour protests. Um, but it sweeps in all of these different types of protests. So it it's could, really, it really could, bad. It could like, ban pro-drag story hour protests. It could ban so many different things. Any, but th that's not the point. The point is that the government doesn't get to decide what we can protest. So Josh, you used to be a journalist and you are using that background in your role now to work on all kinds of different things. You have already written a few op-eds for newspapers. Why don't you tell us about some of the topics you've already written about and have had articles published? Sure. So um, I was really excited to publish this op-ed in the National Post uh, a couple weeks ago about the uh, military's vaccine mandate. So um, I've been studying vaccine mandates for the last few years. I remember when I interned at the CCF a few years ago, Joanna said, Joanna Barron, our, our executive director said, you know, you should look into these vaccine mandates because this is what's coming next. And I was like, no, this is a free country, <laughs> Joanna. Things are crazy, but that's never going to happen here because, you know, you have a right, you own your own body. You have a right to bodily integrity. You have a right to make your own medical choices. That's well established in law. You know, we have this idea about informed consent. And so they're not going to be for, you know, kicking people out of their jobs or kicking people out of the military for not being vaccinated for, for COVID-19. But um, I was wrong. And, uh, you know, I've looked into the law a lot. And I think um, it's pretty clear that where the consequences are so extreme, like you're going to lose your job. You know, the military kicked out hundreds of people at this point. Um, then your charter rights are engaged. So that means that the, the government has to, you know, meet the constitutional test in order for that um, vaccine mandate to, to be constitutional. And in the case of the military, they did not. And this uh, military committee member who was charged with, you know, writing a report, analyzing the constitutionality, she recently explained that um, this is not, this policy was not constitutional. And it's sort of the same arguments I've been making for, a couple of years now so it's, so it's nice to see that someone's finally taking that seriously because we just don't think these are constitutional yeah it was such a great decision even though it's not binding court precedent but we had had so many cases arising from the COVID era where the the rights to make medical decisions for yourself were were not considered and this was one of these rare examples where they were really given the weight that they deserve. And my hope is that this decision will have some sort of impact on our ongoing litigation in British Columbia over vaccine mandates, uh, vaccine passports in that province. We have an appeal coming up in October that I'm planning to attend. So this, I think, outlier decision could hopefully signal a shift in direction 
uh, at least at the tribunal level and hopefully in the courts as well. So Josh, I'm so thrilled that you're joining us as a new lawyer at the CCF and that you came to, to chat with our subscribers today. Any last word for our subscribers on what you're looking forward to? I'm, I'm looking forward to it all. I mean, all of the cases that we do are interesting and uh, important. And if you care about freedom at all in Canada, you should uh, care about these cases. So we're really happy that you're here watching. I hope you'll subscribe to our Not Reserving Judgment a channel on YouTube um, so that you can stay updated on these this news. Also, uh, subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already. You can find that on the CCF website. And, you know, um, just looking forward to, uh, to working with all of you. Thanks so much, Josh. And yeah, to sign up for our email updates, you visit the ccf.ca slash freedom updates, and I'll drop a link to that below. All right. Thanks so much, Josh. Bye.